I have never lived through such a depressing moment as now, right? I mean, that's being realistic. Look at the world today, the world is on fire, and it takes tremendous courage to keep doing what you're doing. I think we have to be, you know, I always say realistic, pragmatic, and idealistic. It's, we have to try to be all of those things because we're literally creating what journalism is today and what it will become. Maria, you're a journalist and you won the Nobel Peace Prize also. What does that tell us about the role of journalists today, this fact? Yeah, you know, the last time a journalist uh, was given the Nobel Peace Prize was uh, in 1936, actually 35, he was he it was when he was awarded, and then 36 was when he was supposed to accept the award. But Karl von Ossietzky was in a Nazi prison camp, and he wasn't allowed to go to Oslo. So it's almost fitting. In 2021, uh, they gave that to Dmitry Muratov from Russia and myself from the Philippines. But but it's very clear they said that we were representative of all the journalists around the world who are under attack. It's been more than a decade of increasing harassment, intimidation, attacks, jailings, and killings of journalists all around the world. Just to do our jobs, you have to be okay with the risks that come with this. And, you know, who, who wants to go to jail? Who wants to deal with violence? And yet, that's what it requires. So, I think it was, you know, I'd asked a Norwegian Nobel Committee. They said that, um, that they had long wanted to give this to journalists, so uh, and that that it it just seemed to be the timing. I mean, ironic. Within four months after we received that, both of our news organizations were in danger of shutdown. And as you know, Novaya Gazeta um, is doesn't exist in Russia anymore. I think what this shows you is that we are in similar times mm -hmm. as World War Two, and you know, the end of World War Two, that that journalism, while the mission of journalism is under attack, the necessity of that mission is even more important to every democracy around the world. Journalists, we are under threat more than ever in the world. Yes. As you mentioned, you met Carlos yesterday, and we were, you were talking, I'm from Ecuador, and everything has changed so yeah. badly in the yes. last two years. Uh, but my question would be, like, how can we remind our audiences the journalists are necessary for democracy. I know it might sound obvious, but it's not. No. So yeah. Yeah. What yeah. Yeah. Are, what would? We, how can we do that? I think first we have to remind our audiences, our the citizens in a democracy, that they are being insidiously manipulated online, on social media, that these tech companies by design are literally prioritizing by design the spread of lies at least six times faster than facts, right? Because this study was done in 2018 by MIT, but today um, X, Twitter now called X, mm -hmm. is owned by Elon Musk. He's fired the trust and safety team. There are no guardrails in place. So look, I think the hard part for us is that even as we do our jobs and it becomes more dangerous to question power, right, just to even question power, we are under constant attack online and in the real world, um, both in terms of the business model and in terms of legal cases that are now being used to silence journalists. We are under attack even as the audiences, the citizens, lose trust, right? So we almost have to redefine again what what trustworthy information is. We need to demand accountability from technology platforms. They can't be making money insidiously manipulating people all around the world. That's, I think, the first surveillance capitalism as a business model should be banned. I mean, this is I'm quoting Shoshana Zuboff when I say that. She was the one who coined a surveillance capitalism. But in the Nobel lecture, I pointed out that 
we're like Pavlov's dogs to these tech companies. They are experimenting on us in real time. And the harmful effects, the social harmful effects, the effects on our children, the fact that there is the Surgeon General of the United States in May said that there is an epidemic of loneliness, right? There are increasing levels of sleeplessness, of suicide. I, the harms are clear. If you are a woman or you are LGBTQ+, if you are marginalized in the real world, you're further marginalized online. So it's a long answer to your question. It's not the old world. We have to convince our people that they and in each of our countries, we have to convince them they, sh they, do, they should not be insidiously manipulated. Because the manipulation comes from companies and countries, mm -hmm. right? And so even as those countries are attacking news organizations, it's a difficult, difficult time. And you know, the only thing I keep saying is that there is something exciting about having to create what a new information ecosystem with trusted information can be. We're not there. When you were talking, you mentioned that you are a recovering journalist, in part because you feel nostalgia that we're not gate gatekeepers anymore. Yeah. What are we then? We are holding on to a checks and balance structure of democracy where citizens can hold their governments, can hold power to account. It used to be that journalists were the, were the interface, right? We received our power from the people. But now, information warfare globally can go directly to the people and manipulate them. And there are, you see the effects in elections all around the world. I don't think we will have democracy if you don't have strong journalists who will maintain the mission of journalism. In 2021, in December 2021, I said that we're stepping on the rubble of the world that was, and we must create what the new world is going to become. We're no longer gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. So we have been relegated to the same situation as an influencer. Please do not ever call a journalist an influencer. No offense to influencers, but our goal is not to be popular. Our goal is not to make money. Our goal is the mission of journalism, which is to hold power to account. But the independent journalist yes. necessarily has to talk about money, especially yes. in countries like ours. Uh, even yes. if we would like to avoid this topic, uh, how did you deal with, the, with it in your case? Yeah. Um, when the government tried to shut us down in January 2018, they scared our advertisers. Um, we dropped in four months. We lost 49% of our advertising revenue. And we would have shut down probably by the end of 2018 if we didn't pivot and find a new sustainable business model. And what we did was we realized that the very same methodology we were using to discover information operations, the insidious manipulation on social media, is something, is a service that we could give companies. And that became a different business model. So uh, our business model is at least 50-50 tech and data now. We must find a new business model because advertising, the old advertising, is nothing like the efficient micro-targeting, right? Which is literally, they have all the data to know our weakest moment to a message and we don't want to do that. That is insidious manipulation. So these are some of the things where regulations have to catch up, but I think more and more, this is part of the reason I'm excited to be here, we must come up with a new business model. We survived, you know, it's been, we survived the six years of the Duterte administration and that shows you we can. Mm -hmm. I, we must find our way forward. Uh, so just a bit context for, for the next question, my last one. So in last year, three journalists were murdered yeah. in Ecuador. And this year, 10 of them are in exile, one of the newsroom I run. Uh, and organized crime is increasing in an unprecedented way. 
um, in your talk you said we should try to be smartly joyful not like in cloudly yes. joyful how do you manage to do it in such like hostile environments like this I think you have to build your community right this isn't we can't do this alone and one news group can't do this alone anymore we you can see that what we tried to do in the Philippines is to pull coalitions together and there we called it a four-layer pyramid um, this is a different time where it's not just the business model it's not just the journalist it's literally democracy that's at stake and if you can't if we don't have a shared reality because we don't have facts how are we going to solve problems like climate change it's Everything is on the line right now. And Ecuador is, you know, in 2017, we were one of 12 research groups that was working with uh, the think tank of Google called Jigsaw. Mm -hmm. And the, the report was called Patriotic Trolling. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with yes. this. And Ecuador was one of the countries where gendered attacks mm -hmm. on women It were, still is. So it was incredibly, that was the first time I realized this. And that report was, was never released. Wow. It was the, if it had been released, the 12 of us all around the world, with the paradigm that it was, it would have been a, an early warning for the world. Mm -hmm. right? So um, we were each allowed to release it, but the collective, the power of the collective whole was gone. So I think this is one of those times where We need to put coalitions together. We need to collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Uh, it's part of the reason I'm here. Mm -hmm. It's also part of the reason that, I mean, I, there's another dream I have, which is, you know, I worked for two decades with CNN. And CNN is an American network in Atlanta that had 31 bureaus all around the world that they put out. Mm -hmm. What if we have 31 countries around the world and we put an international news organization together based on our communities? Why can't we build something like this? Right? Why does it have to be a Western mm -hmm. news organization that has international news? Um, anyway, this is, I've been saying this for a decade, so I don't know, it may not ever happen, but this is one of those times when we can try. Yeah, but yesterday we were talking about that in a, in a Latin American meeting, exactly that. Great! How can we collaborate? But for instance, how can, uh, if something, this year we had this, the presidential candidate murdered, uh, and how can I write an article that can be suitable for international um, audience and just creative commons with mm -hmm. all the media that they can? That's, it's very easy. And, but we, and we have the network. We, we should start it. It's like yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, imagine, right? Because no, who knows our countries better than us? Exactly. And then all you have to do is lift it. Because the problem is, it's like, it's like hyper-local news in the United States. Hyper-local will only go here, but if you're a national news organization, you'll see the bigger pattern. Mm -hmm. And I think we can see international patterns because these, the tech companies actually roll out their tech in our countries, in the global south. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you heard, you know, uh, Slovakia is an experimental yeah. nation. The yeah. Philippines is mm -hmm. one of the places where they experiment. Mm -hmm. So I think there's, there's something there, right? Yeah. That's why the collaboration, I think, is, is critical. Otherwise, we will be swallowed by tech. Yeah, and this is my last question. In Peru, we have an authoritarian government that costs 50 deaths in last month. Yes. All poor and indigenous people. Uh, we, as a journalist, it cannot help but uh, feel hard. My question is, is it okay to feel this way being a journalist? How can we deal with this? Um, I have never lived through such a depressing moment as now, right? I mean, that's being realistic look at the world today, the world is on fire, and it takes tremendous courage to keep doing what you're doing. I think we have to be, you know, I always say realistic, pragmatic, and idealistic. It's, we have to try to be all of those things because we're literally creating what journalism is 
today and what it will become. Uh, you can be tired. Put a good team together, like we did, right? You can, well, <laughs> we have four co-founders in Rappler. We rotate the fear. Only one person can be afraid at a time. And then when it's done, stop, it's my turn, <laughs> you know? Um, I think we have, we're human beings. And one of the things that I've constantly believed in, despite all the bad, is in the goodness of human nature. It's why I became a journalist. Right? Well, what we've run after is corruption, really, because, but I think that we, technology has torn apart. It's almost, technology has created a world where it's, you know, the devil and the angel on your shoulder. Um, you know, this old cartoon in the United mm -hmm. States where you have an angel and a devil and they're telling you to do different things. Well, technology flicked off the angel from our shoulder and the devil grew and went directly into our nervous system. We are good people. I think people are basically good. And so we believe in the good. Yeah, I mean, that's what keeps us going because I think the values of Filipinos have not changed. We signed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And look, after six years of President Duterte, things are slightly better. We'll see. I hope the same thing happens to you. It's a, the world is on fire. It's really tough right now, but I think even more, you know, the, the rewards uh, become better because, because we're fighting such difficult odds. Mm -hmm. I hope so. Thank you, Maria. Thank you.